Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Talk Gnosis. This is part two of our conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Kupperman about the Rosicrucians. Last time we talked about who the Rosicrucians were and their manifestos. In this episode, we're going to discuss were the Rosicrucians uh, manifestos actually a hoax in the first place? Did the Ro early Rosicrucians actually exist? Then we're going to transition and talk about a little bit about the uh, legacy of the Rosicrucian Manifestos and what the people who were living in that time actually did with that information. We're going to talk about the groups that sprung up around that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the intersections of Rosicrucianism, Hermeticism, and Platonism. So stick around for part two of the Rosicrucians with Dr. Jeffrey S. Kupperman coming up. It, it's actually a, a pretty common uh, trope or, or even meme among some people discussing the Rosicrucians that this was all a hoax. So some people got together, uh, they wrote up these documents talking about mysterious Rosicrucians, and you know maybe they believed them in an allegorical way, but some people say no, they're just trying to basically stir the pot. Um, so this this idea that this was all of a hoax is, is pretty common if you can address it and everybody can see my hands moving around a lot and kind of part two of that question is as you mentioned we actually know who wrote the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz but later on in life didn't he say that that was uh, kind of a parody or he was a young man you know uh, kind of having a joke or uh, or such yeah so uh, was this a real order you know that, that sort of the, the basic question, or was this a literary thing maybe meant as a joke? May, may, who, who, I, it's really impossible to say. Um, as, as I think I mentioned, you know, they said, come and contact us and we'll get right back to you. And we know, you know dozens, hundreds of people would write in the, in the papers, would basically taking out Rosicruz and personal ads. Um, <laughs> right, saying, hey, I, here, here I am. I, I want to join and we have no way of knowing if anyone was ever contacted we, we do have some evidence that there were people who were not contacted um, because people <laughs> complain shockingly <laughs> enough um, but whether people were contacted uh, who knows uh, the question is to whether uh, Andre meant this a, as a hoax again that that's that's difficult um, because we have other occult writers um, like Agrippa, uh, Henry Cornelius Agrippa said, oh, no, this was all just, uh, I retract everything that I said. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at, you know, why they're doing it, there's often outside influence. Um, <laughs> they retract what you said or else. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So even when we see that sort of thing happening, it's hard to know if we should take it at face value or if there's something else going on. Um, I suppose if... Andre was really a Rosicrucian, and the first rule of Rosicrucianism is to never say that you're a Rosicrucian, but just say that you're healing the sick. He would almost have to retract it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's all sort of speculation. Uh, to me, the most interesting speculation that goes on this was uh, comes from Count Michael Meyer, um, who is alive in the late uh, mid to late 1500s, uh, early 1600s. He dies in 1622. Uh, and he's a physician, and he's a philosopher, and he's an alchemist, and he composes music. He he, he is an advisor and physician to uh, uh, Rudolf II of ha Habsburg. And he says, in at least some of his writings, he suggests that there was never a single Rosicrucian order, and that was never the point. Instead, the purpose uh, of the manifestos was to inspire the creation of Rosicrucian orders that it would get people who are of like mind to what's presented in the the manifestos get them together and get them doing rosicrucian things hmm. and so instead of representing an actual group it was sort of the um the manifestos of or a building block to you can make your very own rosicrucian group and you can go and do all these rosicrucian things and make the world a better place so um, would you say I, it was something like an open source order of rosicrucians <laughs> I think in modern language, that's what um, Meyer would have said, mm. but in German. Of course, right. Yeah. And which it would probably be one word in German. Oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> And, and this is what, uh, what happened with these documents, right? Uh, you mentioned people trying to contact the uh, Rosicrucians not having uh, uh, any luck, but then we also have people read the documents and maybe they don't join up with this mysterious brotherhood, but they do 
take them into their own workings, their own philosophies. They write treatises on them. They incorporate them into their spirituality. They try to live by them. This this is this was the result for the most part. Uh, they they weren't just written. There was a hubbub, and then they went away. Yeah, I mean, people use them. I mean, you got Michael Meyer who wrote you know, a lot of different things on it. Um, around the same time, you have Thomas Vaughn who wrote his you know Rules of the Confraternity of the Rose Cross. Uh, so you've got groups going into the 17 and, and, and 1800s uh, who are trying to become Rosicrucians. I mean, half of them, of course, say <laughs> we're the ancient Rosicrucians, so far as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but it, it wasn't just this thing that, that died. Uh, it, it's something that sort of continued on. Um, and of course, a, a, as we'll, we'll invariably talk about, there are any number of organizations today um, that claim some sort of Rosicrucian heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Rosicrucians certainly, uh, if <laughs> whether they existed or not, Rosicrucian ideas certainly had a, a big influence on uh, on society. Um, what? Uh, h- how was Rosicrucianism linked to science and kind of utopian ideas? And uh, and can you tell us about the Rosicrucian Enlightenment? Yeah. Okay, so three vaguely connected things. <laughs> um, that's what we do here. We vaguely what, connect things. That is, that's, that's the Rosicrucian way, <laughs> I, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but you couldn't tell us if it was. <laughs> but, but I can't, I cannot I confirm or deny that, but, but we do heal the sick for free. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Rosicrucian section of science is actually really interesting. If you're familiar uh, with English society, there, there is the Royal Society, which is the mm-hmm. Royal Society of Physicians, which was created as a Rosicrucian organization originally, there is, with Rosicrucian foundations. Uh, and it's still going on today. Mm-hmm. Um, not, you know, ostensibly Rosicrucian anymore. Um, but when you read the, the Fama, and, and again, the Fama was published in, in 1614, but takes place in the 1300s, there is a lot of reference and recourse to science. You know, they're, they're charting the heavens, uh, they're, they're learning medicine, uh, they're, they're, they're physicists and, and doctors and astronomers and astrologers, which in the 1300s would have been part of astronomy or astronomy would have been part of astrology. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from the, the, the earliest uh, Rosicrucian writings, they're connecting themselves to science, that science holds a place right alongside mysticism, right along with theurgy or, or magic and alchemy. Um, they're all part of this sort of same way of understanding uh, creation, uh, which is sort of an ideology that, that comes out of the Renaissance, that, that the, uh, God gives the world three revelations. He gives the Bible, he gives Christ, and the world itself is, is revelation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so by studying the world, you can come to know God and Christ better. And so alchemy and science and all and chemistry and all those sort of things come out of this ideology, uh, which is ultimately very mystical in, in nature. Uh, the utopianism is sort of interesting. Uh, Andre himself wrote utopian uh, stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, T- uh, Tommaso Campanella wrote uh, utopian stories. Marcelli Ficino wrote these. Um, you know, they're trying to create this perfect spiritual possibly anti-Catholic society, um, because Lutherans, um, where we're sort of ruled by this, this almost ironically given the, the, the Lutheran background, the, the Lutheranism after Luther uh, becomes heavily philosophical and, and heavily associated with, with the use of reason. All the things that Luther, reje- Luther rejected about Plato and Renaissance uh, Christianity, a lot of the things sort of get brought back into the more mystically, that's a, that's a technical term, <laughs> uh, uh, forms of Lutheranism, in, including uh, the Rosicrucians. Uh, so they're trying to create basically a utopic society of reason and uh, mystical agape and science and, and mysticism and perfect health, both spiritually and um, physically and religiously. Mm-hmm. And this, uh, this obviously never came to pass, but <laughs> as far <laughs> as, as we know. know. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, but what was the influence on uh, later society? Did, 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 um, did these ideas influence uh, later thinkers who weren't necessarily Rosicrucians? Um, 
Yeah, I, especially through things like the Royal Society. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is sort of foundation of, of health. I, we could argue, and this would probably be somewhat, um, shall we say, speculative, that uh, England's entire health care system, you know, I don't want to go so far as to say it's free health care because it's not anymore, could very well be based on the Rosicrucian idea of healing the sick and that for free, mm-hmm. which would have been brought into the, the Royal Society. Um, we, you know, this, this separation between the sciences and the mystical arts and alchemy and things like that, that's really quite modern. Uh, when you, you can go back 100, 150 years, um, uh, maybe even not that far back, where you have, you know, physicians, Newton, uh, you know, sort of the most famous of the, or not physicians, but, you know, physicists like Newton, mm-hmm. who's a practicing alchemist that we, you know, we have his alchemical writings. Um, now, of course, and I'm sure this will shock you, some people do claim that Newton was a Rosicrucian. Of course. Uh, but again, there, we have no evidence of, of that. So, so these, these types of ideas of healing the sick, of creating the, the, the philosopher's stone and the universal medicine, um, which were by no means the invention of Rosicrucianism, or the Rosicrucians, but were propagated by the Rosicrucians or Rosicrucian ideology. We see it sort of influencing uh, everyone um, of uh, an intel- or not necessarily everyone, but a lot of people, um, whether or not they were or were not Rosicrucians. I mean, of course, I mean, later on you get uh, people uh, like um, W.B. Yeats um, and the Golden Dawn folks uh, mm-hmm. who are not just occultists, but, but bring uh, their their occult activities into their their work, mm-hmm. uh, poetry and their artwork and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but I would suggest that even some of the stuff that we see in spiritualism uh, in uh, the early Victorian era uh, may have been influenced by uh, Rosicrucian ideology, this, this trying to find these spiritual truths, which were quite frankly seen as being scientific in nature, that, that you could study these things in a scientific way. Mm-hmm. And it sort of brings us you know, to your other question on the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Now, this is a, a term, as far as I know, coined by Frances Yates, uh, which is difficult because most of her Rosicrucian Enlightenment theory has been debunked. She basically sees the Rosicrucians and the Hermetic, Hermeticists everywhere in history mm-hmm. doing all the things, mm-hmm. um, which there isn't a heck of a lot of uh, evidence to really support anymore. Uh, but that said, her idea of a Rosicrucian Enlightenment influenced Rosicrucian, modern, mm-hmm. the Rosicrucian of, of her time, of, of the 20th century, um, so that we are now back reading this sort of Enlightenment into the Enlightenment era mm-hmm. uh, and seeing this sort of mystical nature coming out of it that we use to inform our own modern way of approaching the world as mystics, as Rosicrucians, as herm- Hermetists. Mm-hmm. That actually leads me to um, a- another question. You, you mentioned that that uh, the Rosicrucians didn't invel- invent alchemy, so, and that's certainly true, but they did incorporate it. Um, what other relationships can you draw between uh, the Rosicrucians and the alchemists and the hermeticists and, and the like? Is, is this one continuous stream, or is, is Rosicrucianism something, uh, something sp- uh, specifically different than hermeticism? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that's going to depend on who you ask. Francis mm-hmm. Yates is going to say, though, they were totally hermetists. Um, and the, from the, the modern, uh, you know, the Victorian area hermeticism, uh, we certainly see elements of that I- 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 in, in Rosicrucianism. Uh, whether or not we see, you know, second century Corpus Hermetica type of hermetism, uh, I would be more on the you know, probably not in any explicit way. Mm-hmm. Uh, there seems to be a, a general sort of uh, Platonism mm-hmm. going on, but you know that's Platonism's everywhere. Right. So yeah. Yeah, can't yeah, swing yeah. a dead cat without hitting Plato. You, you, you really can't. And why would you want to? Quite uh, frankly, no, it's true. It's, um, it's very unpleasant. When it comes to alchemy, you know, today. There seem to be some some divorce between alchemy and Rosicrucianism, depending on which organization you're looking at. Mm-hmm. But it also depends on what we mean by alchemy. Um, the Fama really seems to be talking about 
physical alchemy, you know, laboratory work, mm -hmm. uh, which does have a spiritual element to it. It's not just the puffers, as as they were called. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem to be referring to you know modern spiritual alchemy where where it's all this internal meditation and things like that and only that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which some modern uh, um, Rosicrucian organizations, I think Amork is probably a really good example of that. You know, they focus on that spiritual alchemy mm -hmm. uh, or their version of spiritual alchemy, but you won't see, well, you may see individual members of Amork practicing laboratory alchemy. It doesn't seem to be uh, their emphasis by, by any means. Mm -hmm. um, when you move into like the Golden Dawn, um, we do see some uh, some individual members, certainly. I think uh, Aiton wa wa was a, uh, a practical alchemist. Uh, France, uh, Israel Regardi uh, practiced laboratory alchemy. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the Golden Dawn material itself, it's more, it uses alchemical symbolism in a, in a ritualized manner. Uh, Pat Seleski uh, uh, and uh, uh, Chris Seleski wrote about it, uh, for instance, um, uh, back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's sort of it's it's not even that all alchemists are Rosicrucian or all Rosicrucians are alchemists, uh, but some r modern Rosicrucians were alchemists. Classical, if there's such a thing, uh, <laughs> literary uh, Rosicrucianism was certainly alchemical in nature. Uh, but and people like Michael Meyer, uh, who was a practicing alchemist, uh, you know, brought that but he was a practicing alchemist before he came into contact with rosicrucianism mm -hmm. meyer died in 1622 the fama was published you know less than 10 years before he died so it seems unlikely that he suddenly picked up uh, alchemy on his deathbed uh to, because he is interested in rosicrucianism he was doing that long before rosicrucianism um it was probably why he, part of why he was interested in the rosicrucians because he was an alchemist they were alchemists Let's get this going on. And that's the end of part two of our conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Kupperman about the Rosicrucians. In part three, we're going to be talking about some Rosicrucian orders that exist today, including the uh, Golden Dawn, the Martinist orders, Masonic Rosicrucianism, Ordo Templi Orientis, and of course, the ancient mystical order, Rosicrucius. So you're going to want to check that out. Stick around coming up next week on Talk Gnosis.